in the beginning, they didn't have to do anything but uh, walk out a few yards and pick up oysters. And, uh, and, but as time went on, uh, I don't know why this is the date, but 1702 is when it's documented that hand tongs were introduced to, to the Chesapeake Bay region. And the reason for that was is that by that time, uh, the early settlers began to uh, population began to grow around the waterfront, and uh, they began to eat, they ate oysters. Uh, the slave population began to grow in the area. There began to be more people, and so they could no longer walk out and get the oysters because they had consumed so many of them. So what they did then was is they needed some way to go out and get them in deeper water in 12 foot and 15 foot of water. So uh, hand tongs came along about 1702. And that was a revolutionary type of thing for the seafood industry, you know. But it wasn't really much of an industry in the early years. I mean, it was a, a it was to feed yourself type of a thing, and it and it was that way all through the colonial period, pretty much. It was uh, John Smith on his 1608 expedition, where he you know uh, mapped the entire Chesapeake Bay. Uh, that was one of the places that he came, and he saw a, a flat fish on the bottom, so he took his sword down and jabbed it in it and, and, uh, and pulled it up, and when he did, it was a, it was a ray, and uh, probably a Kano's ray. We don't know for sure, but anyway, it stung him, and, uh, and he nearly died from it, uh, and uh, that's how Stingray Point got its name. But the Oyster Wars relates to the Potomac where Virginia watermen would go out at night and dredge in Merlin, Merlin oyster grounds. And then after a while, this went on and on and on until uh, Merlin established an, an oyster navy and where they would actually go out and, and patrol and try to stop Virginia watermen from, and Merlin watermen too. They were, they, a lot of them would oyster at night dredging. There were, there, were law, there, were, there were laws against dredging on the Potomac too. And, and, you know, most when when you most people think of it when they think of the oyster wars as the Potomac River because it it yeah I think in the 1950s the last person was killed up there it was a tremendous challenge to keep people off those grounds uh, oyster watch houses were built on stilts and men were hired it's another aspect of the fishery men, uh, men were hired to actually stay on the Families, in fact, uh, you know, one of my great aunts uh, spent her honeymoon. Her husband was a oyster watchman, and she spent her honeymoon on a watch house. It was right off of, we call it Kilmer's Point. It's always been called Ball's Point. Mobilize the Jody's got your girl and gone. Mobilize the Ain't no sense in feeling blue. Mobilize the Jody's got your sister too. Mama Liza Jane. Jody this and Jody that. Mama Liza Jane. Sick and tired of that Jody cat. Mama Liza Jane. Hey, Mama Liza. Mama Liza Jane. Hey, Mama Liza. Mama Liza Jane. I got a girl that calls me hun. Mama Liza Jane.
come up short. Gotta pull up the lines, more gotta move around the bend. They say it's a dying breed. They say it's gonna disappear. Nothing I can do. I never had a bad day on the water. I mean, look around. It's just beautiful out here. You don't have anybody to tell you what to do. Or you don't have nobody standing over you. It's up to you to make that dollar. I hear people talk about getting up and driving to work. I can come across the creek in my boat. It's a lot of hard work, but it's fun. It's hard to beat. The oyster is an unlikely looking hero. But if it weren't for this little animal, things might have turned out very differently for the early visitors to the Chesapeake Bay. When the first settlers arrived in America, they were greeted by enormous piles of oyster shells. Native Americans had been eating oysters since they arrived here, thousands of years before. And for the settlers, the oysters were an answer to a prayer. When they were trying to solicit people to come over here, they advertised that there's food everywhere, oysters. They had easy access to year-round food. In the beginning, they didn't have to do anything but uh, walk out a few yards and pick up oysters. But as time went on, they could no longer walk out and get the oysters because they had consumed so many of them. So they needed some way to get them in deeper water. So hand tongs came along about 1702. Oyster tongs were the ultimate in high tech in 1702, the perfect answer for harvesting oysters in deeper water. And they proved so effective that they've been used continuously for over 300 years. Bobby Shackelford knows his way around a pair of oyster tongs. Now in his 70s, he started working the water with his father when he was a boy. I started when I was about eight years old. Third generation, granddaddy, dad, and me, all oysterman. These stones are 22 foot long. Well, this part is called a shad. When we first started tonging the middle of Georgia pine, you could still get some good Georgia pine. Then they, all the Georgia pine paid out, then they started making them with a the fur. And fur is kind of light. So sometimes you had to put some weight on the bottom and keep them down there, they'd float on you. My dad is calling in the morning and Saturday when I won't go to school. And every time he lay them down, I'd try to pick them up and work them. And I went in service when I was 17. I stayed till I was 21. I come out and went to work on the water. I've been on it ever since. The shabs. And that's connected to, to the baskets you see that, which is called heads. They come in 14 teeth, 16 teeth, 18 teeth, 20 and 22 teeth. So all depend on how much man you are. What you do, you try to get your head, your heads flat on the bottom, open them, and you start working them. And you feel your teeth or your tongues going into the shells. And you just keep on working. You just work the tops and let the feel the bottoms go together. It's a lot of hard work, but it's fun. The hard work ain't gonna kill nobody, has No, not. Mm -mm. Hard work won't hurt you, dude. I'd be dead and gone. Yeah. It's just what I like to do. Like tightrope walkers in a circus, oystermen earned a living balanced on the gunnels of their boats. The invention of oyster tongs had created an entire industry. Not only could you eat oysters, you could gather extra and sell them to other people. Families could support themselves. They are able to support themselves, and that's important. And the river provided that uh, in a time when there wasn't much else for people to do. If you're willing to go out there and get it, you could provide for your family. Anybody could go out and harvest oysters. And that was the primary way that this area supported itself from about 1800 to the 1960s. The money, money came from oysters. 
and that's what fueled the banner. It was an oyster town. Urbana, Virginia is a typical southern town with a lot of charm and a long history. The town came to be in 1680 on the banks of the mighty Rappahannock River and soon after was named Herb Anna, the city of Anne after the Queen of England. Urbana is a typical town except for one weekend every year. Once a year, Urbana throws a party. The Urbana Oyster Festival is a yearly spasm of joy and celebration that brings over 75,000 visitors to this quiet corner of the world. People all across America have heard of it. For many Virginians, it's a yearly ritual. It gives city folk a glimpse of life in a genuine small town. And it gives Urbanans a dose of the outside world. I love them, absolutely. I came all the way from Alexandria down here just to eat oysters, okay? Mm -hmm. The Oyster Festival has put Urbana on the map. But what exactly are they celebrating? When we started this, it was just a, to be an event to help the economy of the town in the fall. I was about 57. Back then, the Rappahannock River was full of oysters. So we had a lot of oystermen here. So they said, well, why don't we recognize them? This is, and this is a livelihood for a lot of folks. And why not just name this event the Mountain Oyster Festival? And it stuck, and it stayed that way, and it's still that way. From that, it kind of grew, and then the churches got involved with the kids are selling cookies and cakes and pies. In 1960, we had the first Oyster Festival Queen. The first time we offered a parade, I see the people and the kids in the crowd. They are laughing, they're waving. That makes me have, I don't know, is it pride? Or does it make me just feel good because I see the joy in these people's faces. Now, we have vendors from all over the place. They're local vendors, they're like the Lions Club, the Kiwanis Club, the Rotaries, and they have oysters anyway, you know, roasted, raw. Fried, stewed, thrillers. If you go away hungry, you got a problem. You want to see the Queen Contest, the parade, the Worcester Shopping Contest. It's an exciting time for us. It has a carnival atmosphere. So it changes the atmosphere of the town, certainly. Everybody gets their yard fixed up pretty. They get more plants planted. They want to be sure everything looks nice. The merchants have to get extra help in that two days. They get prepared. Hot one! Hot one! I think that there's a lot of pride in it. Pride in it because it's successful and they have seen what it does for them as well as for this little town and as well as for this county. And I think that's where that pride comes in. <laughs> So many people loved oysters that in 1807, another new technology for catching them turned up on the Rappahannock River. It was aptly named the dredge. In New York, they developed a, a form of gear called a dredge, oyster dredge, that was extremely efficient. An oyster dredge is metal framed, it's got teeth in it. You actually take the boat and you go across the grounds with the dredge overboard, and it's got sort of a pocket in it where you scrape it, and the oysters are caught in that pocket, and then they pull it up. You dredge across the oyster grounds. And as we became more connected to Baltimore and Norfolk and places like that, the seafood industry began to grow. In the beginning, finfish was the main commercial fishery. 
The second is the oyster fishery, and the third is the crab fishery. That's the youngest of all the fisheries. The Rappahannock was a major oyster nursery where market-sized oysters were grown. I mean, the James is where the babies are grown. And they would go down to the James, and they would get them, and they'd bring them up here, and they'd plant them on the, you know, on beds in the Rappahannock. The tiny oyster had become an entire industry. Watermen in Virginia could earn a living from the sea. And unlike many jobs in the South, this one was also open to African Americans. If you had a boat, you were your own boss. My daddy had a boat, and he kept a boat. He had a boat when he died. <laughs> you work for yourself. You bought your license. You bought your boat. That was your own. Nobody said no word about that. But you, you were the boss. Josh Holmes was 92 years old at the time of this filming. He was a waterman's son and left school after the fourth grade to join his father on the water. My daddy told me my first day, he's saying this boat, I can take care of you. But if you go boat, I can't take care of you. And that followed me today. And he was right. He gave me five cents that day, and I carried it home and gave it to Mama. He said, the bank opening today. He called the, the rubber the bank. Well, that's the only place that poor people could make a dollar, you know? That's the reason I stayed on the water. I could always make a dollar if I didn't make but one on the water to mine. I didn't have to take a whole lot of junk off nobody. If you own that boat, you're the captain of her. The river didn't discriminate, the river itself. I mean, if you could go out and you could catch a bushel of oysters, you were gonna get something for that bushel of oysters. It provided jobs for, for, for anyone who was willing to go out and do it. The oyster industry provided jobs off the water, too. Process. You'd probably work harder for yourself than you would somebody else. I used to go in that boat shop and stay uh, 15, 16 hours a day. I know they work Sundays. This is about what I've been doing lately. She was an old crab boat. Me converting her into a little cruiser-type pleasure boat. This is where your lockers go in, your v berths When the wheel is going to run from here up to that, where the floor drops down, I just do it to keep my, it keeps my strength up. And <laughs> my sanity, I guess. <laughs> You've done something that you can look at and you enjoy it. Won't you help me to raise them, boy? Like farmers, watermen harvest different crops in different seasons. Oyster season is in the winter, but in the other seasons, many oystermen get crabby. When I hook the buoy, the other pot's being thrown over. And that way I can, I can pull this one up, then we can go ahead and run to the next one real quick. Well, I went to school in Richmond at U of R and got a degree and worked at a lab. And I really did not enjoy that, being inside. I always liked being outside. I never worked the water before, but I grew up in Deltaville, and I always would go fishing, and I loved duck hunting, and just being on the water and being outside. So I gave it a try. I got a $3,000 loan and put half into crab pots and half into a skiff and a motor. And I've been in debt ever since. <laughs> I uh, crab during the crab season, April the 1st through the end of November. And then I'll either oyster or clam, depending on which one I feel like will be more profitable. And if you can jump from one thing to the other, see, that cuts your wrist down a little bit. But it's something you really gotta like, because if you don't, the, the money is not there like people think. 
your expenses constantly go up, like you know most people's work, and it just you, you gotta love it to stay in it, and that's pretty much the only reason I'm still here. <laughs> and uh, you know, once you start it and you get it in your blood, it's hard to quit. I mean, look around; it's just beautiful out here. It's beautiful. It feels good. It smells good. It's just it's hard to beat. And if you gotta live life doing something, why not? being you know somewhere that you enjoy instead of dread and getting up every morning and going to work that's why i'm here <laughs> i look forward to the mornings another crabby tradition in middlesex county are soft-shelled crabs they're not soft-shelled when you catch them so they need a little help along the way it's all night all day job Keeps you busy, just like babysitters. Can't leave them. Beatrice Taylor and Catherine Vaya have been helping crabs take off their shells since they were little girls. To go to the movie, I had to go crabbing. So I'd go down in the back of my house on Perkins Creek, catch soft crabs. And my daddy worked for Mr. Boyd Hurley. And I'd bring the soft crabs to my dad. He'd write me a little ticket, and I'd take it up to Mr. Hurley. And I'd make enough money to go to movie, which cost 35 cents then, and uh, popcorn and a drink, which was 10 cents. So after I made enough of that, then I'd stop. <laughs> it's different now. We keep going. You put your peeler pots out. You don't put any bait in a peeler pot. The crabs go in there anyway for protection, because they're going to shed their shell. And they're a peeler. This is a peeler. And you can tell the peeler by the red rim on the fin. And you put these in a shedding tank like this. There's another one. And that went from a peeler to a buster. And that's going to be a soft crab in about a half an hour. Each time they shed, they grow. Now see right there, that's the, that's the soft crab coming out now. And it's busting right out of the shell. That's why it's called a buster. All right. See him pulling his legs out? Look. He's got that one out. See these legs in here? He's trying to get these out. Sometimes you have to help him. Like birth and the baby. All right. Now here's the soft crab. This is the shell that it came out of. Look how much it's grown. and it just come out of the shell. But see the size? Now that's a nice, what we call an extra large jumbo, or shipping terms would be a whale jumbo. These are fried, and your hard crabs, you pick them out, pig out. <laughs> yeah, all those that we miss out in the river right now will turn to hard crabs and then they'll get harder and then we'll catch them and sell them as hard crabs. About two to three weeks and they'll get good and fat, ready to steam. That's a watermelon stream and the next day we'll be back. <laughs> it's gotta be. It's gotta be. The 1950s promised to be a great decade for Urbana and the oyster. The oyster wars, a hundred year feud over fishing rights, was finally over. And Hurricane Hazel caused a population explosion among oysters in the Rappahannock. Business was booming. But in 1959, marine scientists made a fateful discovery. Two new diseases had begun to infect the oysters in the Chesapeake. They were called Dermo and MSX, and they were deadly in more ways than one. It's destroyed a, a natural resource that, that uh, not only was an e of economic benefit, but an environmental benefit, more so than anything else, because it's a filter feeder. It acts as a, as a cleaner, uh, it cleans up the bay. They suck water in, it goes through their body, and it has a cleansing effect. And that's why the state of Virginia has, has poured so much money into trying to, to bring back the oyster. Everybody's doing aquaculture now. And that's, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm actually getting big into. 
Rufus Ruark is part of the solution on the Rappahannock. His family-run shucking house still processes oysters, but they also recycle the shells to rebuild depleted oyster reefs. And they're experimenting with disease-resistant, fast-growing oyster larvae to help rebuild the industry itself. It's called remote setting. It's when we take microscopic larvae, 22 and a half million will be about the size of a golf ball. And we'll let them set or strike onto the oyster. When the oysters spawn, they need to have something to attach to. And we have shells bagged and cleaned, and we'll put these into the tank. Then you feed them. And then you just, in seven days to eight days, and I will take all these out from the river and plant them on, on the rock, oyster rock. This has already been proven to work in a couple locations and, and had one heck of a return. They put 200 bushels over and got 900 out. I'm doing it because I, I think it works. This is a big push to help replenish the, the oysters, help clean up the bay so the people that work the water can have, have a job to do. It never died. No, it, it, uh, it went as far down as you could probably go and that it's coming back. Aquaculture, new ways of growing oysters, new ways of combating MSX. It's important that we encourage it to continue to go on. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, they've been big enough. I mean, these things are doing pretty good. I mean, this gives some. you a lot of hope, you know. Yeah, we have to, don't die. A lot of hope. The independent waterman may be disappearing from Virginia's rivers, but here on the Rappahannock, their spirit is everywhere. We changed our office into a kitchen, and we serve soft crab sandwiches, crab cake sandwiches, crab nuggets, and they all flock down here for it. They say it's a dying breed. And I've just been around the water my whole life, and I just, I like it. Basically, all we're doing is surviving, like a lot of people. We either worked on the water or you we worked on boats, <laughs> so I sort of like boats. It's a hard, honestly. You work hard for a dollar. They're the epitome of, of being what you would want somebody to be, in the sense of work ethic, maybe, dedication, commitment. Watermen are extremely independent. They're an independent breed. They don't live by a time clock. They don't know how much money they're gonna get in a week or in a day. You have to be a fairly independent type of a, a person to want to work the war. Not bad, huh? Good. Damn. I don't need no supper. Damn good. <laughs>